Okay, so um, uh, Creative Commons license in front of all our presentations. Came by from our workshop. I add this one, which is basically encouraging you to, to share and copy and, and reuse. And in the context of a, a lecture, what um, remixing allows is basically you can go take go to the slide deck. So actually, I haven't linked to it yet, but I'm going to also I also make my PowerPoint files available. So that means you can go into my slide deck and take the one slide you want, with the caveat that uh, you need to share your slides as well. So this afternoon, sort of to ease off into the end of this workshop. Uh, workshop we're gonna do Galaxy so how many of you have used Galaxy before how many of you have never used Galaxy how many of you that have never used Galaxy have never heard of Galaxy okay that's oh, yeah oh there you go you better well it's I've been as well <laughs> so so the Galaxy developers uh, if you have any suggestions for my slides, let me know. <laughs> uh, this is not for Galaxy developers. So um, this is who I am. This is the tweet handles for, should have shown that at the beginning of the workshop. And the use Galaxy is, a, is the major uh, Twitter handle for whenever you tweet about Galaxy. So the disclaimer is I'm not going to make any profits from anything, companies or products I may talk about. I am on the Galaxy Scientific Advisory Board, but I don't get any money from that. So I just they just get I just work for them for free. So um, we're going to talk about workflows. We're going to talk about basically reproducibility in science and how Galaxy can be used to do that. And we're going to use it in the context of next gen sequence analysis. But uh, Galaxy itself, as a tool, predates next gen sequencing, and so there's a lot. Uh, part of the Galaxy Toolkit is actually uh, used to do a lot of other things that predates next-gen sequencing. So really, uh, if you're interested in Galaxy, you've probably, and if you've already used it, you've probably used it outside the context of, of next-gen uh, sequencing. So what do biologists do? Well, we make observations, uh, make hypotheses, and challenge them, and include uh, things, and and then we write papers and we now are more and more are doing this in the context of RNA-seq or protein mass spec or interaction pathways and so forth. So there's a lot of information space that we use. The central dogma, as you know, is DNA makes DNA, makes RNA, makes proteins. The sort of the, what I like to call the NCBI version of the central dogma is DNA makes RNA, makes proteins, and then you write a paper about it. And in, in that, Unfortunately, is uh, the challenge with the reproducibility of science is that a lot of the uh, information about a paper, a process, an experiment is actually highlighted, described in a publication. And so if you're doing sort of um, bioinformatics archaeology, so you're trying to reproduce uh, a pipeline or, or method that was used in a paper, you have to go read the paper in detail and try to extract the versions of the tools they use, if they talk about the versions, the tools that they use, if they actually talk about the tool, and so forth. So there's a lot of, of hidden information and not always available, unfortunately, and making reproducibility in science uh, very difficult. Some of the things that uh, we do in the cells is to do experiments, as I mentioned, and so we do uh, bioinformatics experiments. So I think of bioinformatics experiments as a same way as I would a sort of wet lab experiment. It's got reagents, it's got, uh, you do controls, you do uh, interpretation and so forth. And so a classic bioinformatics experiment would be uh, using uh, BLAST. So how many of you have never heard of BLAST? A few. Okay, good. <laughs> so basically in BLAST you have reagents, and so your sequence and your databases you have a method, so you're doing either a protein-protein search or a nucleotide protein search or, or a translation of the pro nucleotide and so forth. So those are various types of blasts you can do. And then you have an alignment from which you sort of get interpretation. You look at similarities and you're testing, I, I, you're doing a hypothesis testing. So you're testing whether or not there's a similar protein or a similar gene 
in your organism versus organism X, or if there's a gene that you've sequenced, you're trying to figure out what function it may have by have hit having similarity to another uh, gene in another organism for which has been better studied. For example, studied in mouse for which there's knockouts and phenotype versus your human disease gene. And so you have to know your reagents and when you do your experiments, you have to know your methods and you have to do your controls. So uh, what kind of control could one do in BLAST? Not all at once now. So if you want to do a control, what you want to do a search, what, what's a conceptually? This is not a conceptually. What kind of what's a an idea of a control? So yeah. So for example, if you have a cDNA, you know. You have the full genome of the organism that you've got the cDNA from. You do a cDNA a nucleotide against it, that genome, that single genome, you should be able to find it, right? So if you don't find it, there's something wrong with BLAST. And there's something wrong maybe with the parameters you're using. The same way if you're using a protein database and you have your favorite protein and you're searching this, you know the protein's in the database, but if you use a certain set of parameters, then you can't find your protein. That means you know you're using the wrong parameters. So that's sort of a, uh, a positive and a negative control that you can think about. So um, the concept about doing and redoing experiments is that uh, usually if you do something once, you don't usually script it up. But if you do it 100 times or 1,000 times, you definitely will want to. Um, if you want to share the way you did something, it's usually better to instead of telling somebody I use this tool and that tool, is actually share the script that you did the analysis with or, or the method. Or and sometimes um, uh, scripts get too complicated and you have to think about something else. So some of the requirements that are sort of standard in, in computational biology, not, oops, sorry. Okay, so standard and computational about not 100% uh, the same always, but definitely quite common is that the sources that we work, the tools that we work with are open source. We sort of make it a, uh, it's been a standard in the bioinformatics.ca workshop series that all the tools that we teach are open source tools. I would say that the bioinformatics community, as opposed to the chemistry or as opposed to physics and whatnot, maybe not maybe as much as physics, maybe less than chemists, has, has been fully um, embracing of the open source community in general. And so uh, if you go to any sort of large scale sort of genome informatics or biology of genome conference, uh, the tools that are talked about and the, the tools that are used in the analysis that are talked about are always open source tools 99% um, of the time. Um, the advantage of, of course of the open source community is that you have many more eyeballs on, on, on the data on the source code and on the analysis and what the code is actually doing. It's not a black box phenomena which is a sort of a concern and uh, allows people to share and, and, and make things provide different versions and, and, and so forth. A good example of a sort of a community that uses a really sort of large uh, set of, of open source tools that has been talked about already at this workshop is R and Bioconductor. And R is a little hard to tag on a, on a tweet on Twitter. So the, the usual tag for R is R stat, so statistics. And um, uh, Robert Gentleman wrote, wrote this great paper a few years ago about uh, reproducibility of, of uh, research in using bioinformatics as a case study. And Robert sort of argues for the inclusion of all in all your papers of all the scripts that are used to generate all the figures that are presented, presented in a paper so that Anybody can take your script that you wrote to generate that figure 
they can reproduce that figure, they can put in their numbers or their data and see what figure they generate, or they can modify uh, your script and, and make it better and so forth. So there's really sort of a, a strong argument for the R community and, and the use of Bioconductor, which is also itself uh, it's got more and more modules over the years to do a next-gen analysis. Another sort of more recent paper, which has uh, been quite good, is uh, from the um, uh, James and Anton and other colleagues in the sort of um, uh, galaxy community about ten from a plus paper on ten simple rules for reproducibility in uh, computational research. And this is sort of a quick summary of these rules. Uh, for every result, keep track of how it was produced. Um, avoid um, manual data manipulation steps, i.e., you know, going into a file and editing things that you don't like. Um, archive the exact versions of all external programs used. Um, version control all custom scripts. Uh, um, record an intermediate results when possible in a standard format uh, for analysis that include randomness note underlying uh, random seeds, so BWA is an example of that. Uh, always uh, store raw data behind plots when that's possible. What's an example of where we can't, we don't keep raw data anymore? Wakey, wakey. No, no, in life sciences. Sort of related to this course a little bit. Yes, the image, the image files from sequencers. We don't keep those anymore. And so that's, it's really, we are moving away from um, keeping all raw data. It's just, we don't do it. And, um, but it's a, in general, uh, if you can and want to make things reproducible, you want to keep as, as feasible as possible. So there's feasibility that comes into a fact, uh, factor, which is basically cost and storage and, and things like that which are becoming some in some cases become very becomes very difficult um, generally um, hierarchical analysis output allowing layers of increasing details and in, in, in to be inspected and uh, connect textual statement in the underlying results and rule number 10 uh, provide public access to scripts uh, runs and results so there are different ways of doing that. One way that we use actually at the OICR is a tool called Sequare, which is a uh, very um, uh, command line rich and uh, very uh, powerful tool to, to run multiple pipelines. And so all the pipelines we do in next-gen sequence analysis at OICR and the sequence production group are all run through Sequare. Sequare, in a nutshell, will um, write down uh, writes all arguments in metadata files and so forth to a metadata base so it keeps track of of the tools the versions of the tools the arguments used on on the tool and where which file where the file came from and what the output file was written to and so forth and so that you can go back and keep track of have very detailed experiment and also you can program it in a way that it knows when sequencing runs are finished it looks for the files it needs that the run is ended, and then it can start a whole chain of events that it needs to do to, to run your, your pipeline. And so it's a very powerful tool. It's uh, apart from one or two people in this class, it's sort of beyond this, the people in this class. But I just wanted to sort of make you aware of, of, um, of its existence. Another tool that can where you can do pipelines and keep track of which tool versions and which parameters and so forth to use is Galaxy, and that's the one we're going to be using in this class. So there's lots of papers written about Galaxy. Um, their uh, Galaxy is an NIH-funded project, and so all, all, yeah, I would say all of its publications are open access publications. So this is a bit older paper, but it's very uh, relevant. Mm -hmm. This one is much more detailed on using uh, Galaxy in the cloud, and is also very relevant to this class. And um, the first thing you sort of become aware when you're starting to use Galaxy is the various versions of Galaxy that are available. So if you want to see all the various types, the home page is the galaxyprojects.org page, 
which has information about all the things I'm going to talk about today. The, um, the main Galaxy public Galaxy server is called usegalaxy.org and actually that's um, an entry to another server and the server has actually recently moved but the URL is still the same, usegalaxy.org and that's the main Galaxy public server so you can go there for free and use all the sort of the richness of Galaxy and we're going to be doing some of that later today. Another one is uh, getgalaxy.org, so that's the source code for uh, Galaxy, so that you, if you want to download Galaxy and install it locally on your, uh, on your own machine in your department or your institution, that's where you would get uh, the source code. I, uh, if, you have, if you're in a university that has good computer infrastructure and good systems people and so forth, uh, I would recommend this this avenue where you can customize and make sure that you have the versions of the tools and so forth that you want locally. So at OICR we have a version of Galaxy so that we run internally behind our firewall so it's all secure and with our data access and so forth. So there's all sorts of, yes? Do you have to what? Update, um, ask the guy sitting next to you. <laughs> so uh, Zyvin does, uh, Zyvin does all the sort of the Galaxy updates. The, the major updates is when people want a certain tool updated so that um, uh, the, the, the actual, the box itself, the Galaxy box doesn't have to be updated that often, but adding the version, you know, Top Hat 2 and, and so forth, that's, that's more updates. They do, um, they make a tool shed available, which I'll talk about a bit later, which makes sort of uh, updating of tools a bit easier. And, but it's a, uh, that's the main, that's the main uh, activity for uh, maintenance, I would say. So a third version of Galaxy, the first one is the main public server. The second one is you install it on your own machine. A third one is a cloud version, which is basically using Galaxy in the cloud, which is what we'll be using today also and um, that version is actually running on Amazon and uh, you could install Galaxy on other clouds should you be so in uh, inclined but the, uh, the uh, Amazon image that has Galaxy is available publicly available to anybody who wants to use it so that allows you to start using Amazon directly in the cloud. Um, yes? If you have Galaxy Yes. For certain functions, you need more computational power. Can you seamlessly go to the cloud and use Galaxy in the cloud for some functions of it, or are you committed to using it locally if you start as an analysis locally? So that's a good question. So the idea is so the, the the big caveat there is the data. So then you have to transfer the data to the other place where you want to do the computes on. Uh, on Amazon in general, they don't charge for uploads, and so the bigger files that you're uploading, and if you do a bunch of analysis, and then you end up with a smaller file at the end usually, and you download that file. So you have to, you're charged for the computes, and you're charged for the download. Um, so I think the concept, the 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 use of clouds as a um, on a you know I need more horsepower three times a year is actually a very rational use of, of, of using the cloud. And, it's, and I think that's sort of the, um, the market niche that, is, that suits, I think, bioinformatics the, the best. I think the large HPC, people that have large compute infrastructure like ourselves, we actually we would want to use Amazon you know, uh, or something like it on a, in a sort of spot instance type of activity as well. But it, we have uh, challenges with respect to um, uh, consent forms and, and access because it's human data that we're dealing with so it's it's a bit complicated to use on Amazon but um, even though Amazon is I think more secure than than, than most academic clouds uh, or academic uh, uh, compute infrastructures um, so apart from the data transfer sh I, I sure so you can do you know you do or you could do use the public version, and it, until if it's if it the, you do the big jobs and then you do the big jobs on Amazon and then you maybe you you um, you use the um, your, the public version for the rest. I mean that's another way of thinking about it as well. So the the nice thing about your private version of it is that you have 
all the controlled access rules and things like that are usually applied to your institution or to your to your compute infrastructure that you control, that, that's usually easier to deal with. Yes? Like from a company. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's and there's other companies too. Yeah. And then actually, and fourth or fifth option is um, other people. I mean, sort of this one, sort of commercial entities fall into this category as well. Is sort of uh, other versions of Galaxy hosted elsewhere that are either public or private, and so you can have uh, those. So would have are often specialized, so that I know there are some specialized, for example, in transcriptomic analysis or, or in mass spec analysis and things like that. So you can go to, there's about, there's more than 50 of them right now, which are public. Uh, you can go upload your own data. It's at university X, Y, or Z, and, and then you can do your analysis there. So this is the homepage for the Galaxy project, so it points to all the things I just talked about. And it also points to um, a lot of tutorials, videos, and so forth to learn about uh, Galaxy, and I highly recommend it. So this is the um, usegalaxy.org homepage. So if you go to Galaxy now, this is what it would look like. That said, I don't want you to do that right now, but if you did do it, that's what it would look like. And on the left side, this generally is, is all the tools and the, the actions that you can use to, to get, get started with Galaxy. On the right side is sort of the history of where things are at and what you're doing. And in the middle is usually the results or the parameter setting or sort of the activity side is where you, you do things and you, you look at the results as well. So this is a getgalaxy.org. So it's got a whole sort of very... Um, uh, active uh, user community that will help you install and, and run. I remember when we installed um, uh, Galaxy here, they were actually provided all sorts of help and they even, this is before I was on their scientific advisory board, they even offered to send a developer to, to if we needed to, to help us install it locally and they were really keen to, to, get, uh, to get going. And now they have Actually, on their help desk, they have um, two people, basically. One that deals with all the email, and it's um, probably on the order of you know, 50 to 100 emails a day and, and responding to, to questions and so forth, and sort of looking at all the various uh, uh, Biostar and, and, and various activities, uh, various portals for uh, questions, and Twitter and so forth. And then the other one is, is basically, the second person is basically is a traveling uh, show person and goes to all the various conferences and, and does a lot of the presentations and monitors, uh, also monitors uh, the various news groups. So the cloud has also lots of details about the various uh, um, ways of, of using the cloud, and then we'll, I'll show you that a bit later. And then, like I mentioned, there's about 50-plus uh, uh, Galaxy uh, servers that are dealing with various uh, uh, types of, of specialized or more generic uh, Galaxy project uh, providers. So why would want? So who's the, you know the target audience for Galaxy and so forth? So um, so Galaxy talks about um, integrating input and and data at the source. It really talks about uh, make many tools that you don't need to install and maintain. So it's like a one-stop shop to do a lot of uh, bioinformatics, simple and complicated bioinformatics analysis. Um, it also allows you to maintain workflows, reuse them, and then share them. So you can develop a workflow, and then you can share with your colleagues and so forth. So it makes it very easy to, to, to share and publish experiments. So you can even think about working on a workflow, putting it, publishing it within Galaxy, making it publicly available, putting it in your paper, and having people having a very detailed description, basically, of what you did in your analysis through a workflow that is in a publication. So with the publication, 
you would have all the sort of the metadata about you know your samples and your experiments and so forth. But in the workflow, they could see the version of the tools you use, the parameters you use in your tools, and they could sort of plug in their own data and repeat your experiment. So it would be a very uh, positive way of, of sharing uh, published protocols, bioinformatics protocols. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, uh, is is fully so Galaxy is fully in the next gen space, but it, there's it predates, so it's been around a lot longer before. So you, there's a lot of of uh, analysis on genetic analysis, GWAS type analysis, uh, R stats package are integrated into uh, Galaxy, and um, a number of other uh, experiments. Um, and like I mentioned, it also works in the cloud now. So one of the central sort of core and dogmas of Galaxy is reproducibility, so being able to reproduce an experiment. Um, so it keeps a history of what you did, and so you don't have to uh, write it down yourself. It actually uh, automatically tracks these things, and you can save them, and you can share the histories between uh, with others. And it makes it very easy to work with uh, collaborators uh, down the hall or across the globe. Um, Galaxy is really designed with the biologist in mind and so that it, uh, it thinks like a biologist more than it thinks like a programmer and it's really meant for biologists to keep track of their experiments and it's, uh, its graphical user interface is made for biologists. It's, uh, uh, it's really um, a, a tool for biologists. Programmers may find Galaxy very frustrating because it's not scriptable, it's not as easily, although there are um, new versions, I'm seeing people, Ed's nodding in the back there, that I know there are people that are developing scriptable versions of Galaxy, which is sort of counterintuitive when you think about it, but uh, that is, there's actually a big demand for that, so there's the sort of the growing so I've done my pipeline, I've done it once, but I want to do it a hundred times now. How do I make that happen? And there are ways that are being developed to make that happen. And so uh, Galaxy is very, team is very responsive. It's about a dozen people or so, and eight to 12 people in, in the core team and um, on two sites. And they are um, really, uh, they really listen uh, quite a lot to, to their community. And, but it also has a larger community, a non-Galaxy staff, basically, that are also developing things for the tool shed. People are developing tools. One way to get their tools across use by the community is to wrap it in Galaxy and so then putting it up in the tool shed. So new versions of the latest tool that you're making, if you make them available in Galaxy, uh, that's a good way of, of propagating uh, that tool to the community. Um, so the, uh, basically, like I mentioned, it helps biologists, deals with all the tools and data. It's NIH, NSF, and Penn State, and now uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University uh, funded uh, initiative. Um, oh, my slide's out of date. It's not Emory anymore. He, um, James Taylor just moved from Emory to Johns Hopkins uh, last January, and uh, there's lots of learning material that's available in the URL here. So some of the challenges with Galaxy is that not all galaxies are created equal. So you can go to two different Galaxy public servers, or you can go to the Amazon one or versus the usegalaxy.org, and you won't find the same tools. And so because they all have their own, so that can be a little frustrating sometimes. And we might even share some of that frustration with you today. <laughs> and um, the model, one of the things that Galaxy team is thinking about is sort of, a, a sort of a distributing Galaxy as an empty shell. Basically, uh, Galaxy, sorry, question, sorry. No, nothing's guaranteed because any any tool, so it, it uh, no, there's no guarantees because it can be basically the administrator of that Galaxy instance will have um, 
will have can change the, the tool version. So what they can do is they can have multiple t versions of a tool available, so that you can you use one place, you use one version, and you go to another place, and you'll see there's two different versions. So you can use the old one and the new one. Uh, the usegalaxy.org, which is the public server one, is probably the most has the most up-to-date generic tools across that are used mostly. But then you'll have a specialized you know, transcriptomic galaxy server, which will have the latest in transcriptomic analysis tools. So you want Yes, so actually if you have, when you, if you have a URL for your, for a page, which has all the, the, the things you're tracking, that URL will keep, every, will have everything. What, what, it will have the versions of the tools and so forth. And you can take that page and that uh, saved, pipeline and run it on any server, except it might break if they don't have the version of that tool. And so then you have to tell the maintainer of that server to install that tool to be able to reproduce the exact. But the one you did is, is, is accurately tracked in your, in your own uh, document. So uh, like I mentioned, so moving to a sort of an empty shell and then we'd have sort of a cafeteria model where you go pick up the tools you want, the versions of the tools you want. And that's referred to as uh, the tool shed. And um, that's turning out to be, I think, a great um, uh, solution for that because the tool shed not only offers you the full menu, so to speak, of, of all the, the things that are available, it also provides you with um, star systems. You can rate things and, and, and give it a, and, and comments and so forth. So it's a really uh, useful way of, of doing things. So how does the general workflow work in Galaxy? So first you log in, so you don't have to log in, but if you do log in, then it'll keep track of history for you. So that's a really useful thing to do is to actually, if you use the public Galaxy or your the, the cloud version is to, to actually log in. Then you get data or you upload your data, so you can you know do one or the other. So there's lots of data sources within Galaxy, or you can upload your own data. Then you manipulate your data, so you do experiments on your data, and you can repeat that multiple times. Then you save your output, and basically you can save that into a workflow. So this part of manipulating the data, saving the output, you can make a workflow out of that. And you can publish a page of, which includes the data plus the workflow into a page document, so that it allows you to um, use your data into this pipeline, or you can say people can put their data into your pipeline. Yeah. It's relatively easy. Uh, it's a bandwidth. I mean, it's a bandwidth issue. So if you're uploading, you know, large fast queue files, it may take a while. Um, there are very very soft quotas right now on the on the public galaxy server um it's you can do it by same as an igv for example you can do it with urls you can do it with uh you know reading files from your directory and so forth so it's pretty from that point of view it's, it's quite straightforward yeah there are also examples of different uh clients to upload that can be used also like to large you know, better than FTP and, and things like that. So, uh, that's available as well. This is time for sponsor announcement. So, uh, Zeebin has been uh, sort of a great Galaxy administrator. So he's, he's he uh, used to work at OICR and then he installed Galaxy at OICR. He installed tools on the Galaxy. And so we still, on contract, we still take some of his time and and enjoy working with him very much and he still uh, does things for us and um, and he's the one that's been administrating the the, the galaxy server for, for us for us for these two days and so I don't want you to do this right now but note the page maybe you put a corner on it because we'll come back to it later at the at the end of the of my lecture which is going to be um, basically how to log into galaxy and what we're going to do in the, in the class later is we're going to lo log into the cloud, which is basically going to kick off a Galaxy instance on Amazon. 
So you hit the cloud, you get this page, you log in, you put in your CBW number and um, the credentials, and we'll get that to you later. You don't have it yet. We purposefully are not showing you the, the, the passwords now because we don't want you to log in now. <laughs> and uh, then you get this uh, launch uh, Galaxy page, you click on the link, and then you enter your login password from the previous page. Um, and then you press uh, keep everything in a default state and choose uh, the platform type. And then you get this sort of uh, cloud man console, which shows you one instance of, Gal of Galaxy running. Uh, here, if you wanted to, we're, not gonna, we're only going to each run one. But if you wanted to, if you're doing this at home and you wanted to have more boxes working on your project, you have larger, you want more CPU, you can select more instances and, and increase. And this is where you would do that. After things are all warmed up, then you use, it has the um, uh, start Galaxy button, and then you press that, and then you get an instance of Galaxy. And this is a Galaxy in the cloud. It's very similar to the other Galaxy that I showed you before. It has all the tools on the left, all your history to the right, and in the middle part, it's got the, the sort of work in progress. So um, what... I'm going to do uh, today, right now, is I'm going to show you a pipeline of, of an exercise that you will not do. <laughs> but, uh, and what we're going to do is I'm going to go through just to show you the mechanics of using Galaxy. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a transcriptomic experiment, which is something that is not part of this workshop, but is, for those of you interested in mRNA analysis, uh, is a, could give you an, a, a taste for it. We have actually a separate transcriptomic next-gen sequencing workshop uh, that is sold out for this year. So if you want it, you have to come back next year if you haven't done it already. And uh, we this year, we actually didn't offer it in Toronto. We only offered it in Montreal and in Vancouver. And next year, it will be in Toronto. So we're going to have it in Toronto uh, next summer. So if you're interested in transcriptomic workshop, a little marketing here. And so... Um, before you start, as I mentioned on, on Use Galaxy, the good thing to do is to log in. And so um, you register. So if you've never, the public in, instance, you will, you're, you'll be a new user, so you'll have to register. Even if you registered on the cloud before, uh, you, it's, it's as if you were the first time because this is a new machine that's never seen anybody before. And so you'll have to register. And once you've registered, then you'll see... Um, Saved things and so forth. So it's a really sort of good way to, to go back at that stuff. And so, Galaxy in the Cloud, as I mentioned, is the same tools on the left, history on the right, and in the middle. So, this is an example of, let's say, this page of Galaxy um, uh, in the Cloud, the things that are in one but not the other. And so, I did. So I basically uh, did a list of tools and I did diffs between the two and that's what the less than sign and greater than sign are from their diffs between the two lists of, of tools. So this is an example just to give you a taste of the differences between the way things are organized and the two, uh, the public usegalaxy.org versus the galaxy in the cloud. And what's going to happen is that actually in the lab that we're going to do today, there are some tools which are only available on the public version and are not available in the cloud version. So we're going to do the first part in, of the lab in the cloud. We're going to take our saved file and then we're going to move it to the public version if we have time. If we don't, then you'll something you can do on your own because the last part would be to, to be done on the public uh, version of the cloud. But it gives you an idea of we're going to try to do the same, the module 2 and part of module 3 maybe in... in uh, the same way that you did from the command line with uh, with Michael yesterday, and so we're going to do that in Galaxy today. So it's going to be the sort of the the other way of doing it, very similar, but with a different version of BWA and so forth. So all the sort of caveats of uh, the sort of uh, 
uh, representing all the cha challenges of uh, different versions of things being uh, done in different places. So um, all the items on the on the left panel, if you click on them, they'll probably expand into a multiple choice. And so often it's actually it's quite the, the left panel is quite rich, has a lot of different tools, and sometimes it's a little hard to, to find the one you're looking for. So a, a common way I use I do to go is let's say I'm thinking of a NGS tool, then I'll just type in NGS and then it will filter on the top panel. You type something and it will filter for, for that string of, of, of words of, um, to on the tools that are that match that string, you can look for filter. You can look for um, uh, if you know you're looking for BWA or or some of that. So you can do on the top search box. You can use that and um, to uh, to find something. So for example, if you type in Sam, then you'll find all the tools related to to, to Sam. And so if you do SAM on the cloud versus SAM on, on use Galaxy, you, you find different things. So one of the big data sources, and I've only had a couple of slides on this, but just one of it, because it's an important data source, so apart from um, uh, your own data, so one of the things you may need, for example, is a uh, reference uh, gene model set. So known genes for uh, from HG19 that are um, available so all the gene models that are available so you, one way one place to get those from is from the UCSC genome browser and so the browser makes obviously the the data available in, in, a, in a browser view that, as we saw in the last uh, couple of days but it also makes available the data available in table format and so this is the table format is used by Galaxy then it can then incorporate into uh, various uh, outputs that it, it uh, generates, it uses. So it's a very, and Galaxy and USC Genome Browser know about each other, it, and they will allow, for example, to send jobs one way or the other. So you can have results from uh, UCSC end up in Galaxy, and vice versa, Galaxy ends up in, in UCSC Genome Browser. And so this is your standard uh, homepage for the Human Genome Project. And so uh, other examples, I mentioned the, the, uh, the, the standard genome you know, view of, you know, with all the tracks and so forth. But you can also have tab separ separated files. You can have sequence and FASTA files, uh, FASTA format. Um, there's VED format, which is the uh, browser extendable data format. The, the, GFF, which is general feature format, and the GTF, which is the gene transfer format. So all these formats can be used, are generated by, by um, uh, UCSC, and can be imported into Galaxy. So this is a FASTA file. So, um, so has anybody ever used a FASTA program? You have. And well, here's an older one, fast N and fast P. No, okay, well, I'm the only one that has used that one. So fast A is a Lipman and Pearson uh, searching algorithm which predates BLAST. And in one of the major contribution that that program did is, is to um, propose a format for protein and nucleotide files. And the file format is relatively simple. It's a greater than sign a string, and then the sequence. That's it. That's the only specification of the, of the format. Um, NCBI, EBI, and all these various other places have added more structure, and SwissBroad as well, have added more structure to that link, that line, that first line of string that they have some of their own codes and so forth. And But basically, fast day is a greater than sign, any string that describes what the, what's in the file, and then the sequence. At NCBI, we... Um, where I worked for a few years, we used to have programmers that have come from physics and not the sort of life sciences world. And we used to just explain to them that if it's, you know, the difference between a protein and a nucleotide file is that if it's less than 85% ACGT, it's probably a protein file. 
<laughs> they they got it <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> so this is um, the bed format. So the the one of the great things about the UCSC uh, website is actually it has a description, a very good description of all these various formats that are used by all these various uh, that's used by uh, IGV, it's used by UCSC, used by Galaxy, and so forth. One of the sort of go-to place for me to for all the uh, is the uh, just search UCSC file formats, and, oops, UCSC file formats, and you'll get the, the, all the description of all these various file formats that are used for these various tools, so GFF, GTF, and so forth. So this is a general workflow for Galaxy I mentioned, and what there are in uh, there are pages in Galaxy, so you can actually go to a page and look at workflows that have been publicized by either by Galaxy staff or by other people that want to make things available publicly available. So there's a place to keep all the uh, published pages. And they have star rating. And so the, you can have an you know, RNA seq uh, uh, page. On, so they have make the data available. They make the, the pipelines available and so forth. So you can just download the data, download the pipelines, and run the workflows. And it's quite, um, quite useful. A Galaxy um, uh, team member Jeremy uh, has has done a lot of RNA seq analysis pipelines and, and workflows and pages and and is making them all available on on this uh, on this website. So this is the RNA seq analysis exercise. All the data is is publicly available data. What they've done same trick that we've done in many of the workshops here is they've done transcriptome from a very small region of the genome, so it makes the file smaller and easier to, to process. And so in this case, they have uh, brain and thymus and uh, pancreas and ovary, I think, RNA. So these are the places to get the data set. So these are all publicly available, so you can copy. So you'll have the PowerPoint file, so you can copy and paste these URLs. Or if you like to type, you can type these URLs. And basically, uh, you can load the files. So the, the first things you do in Galaxy is you load files. And um, you many years, often you leave the parameters to, um, to default. So this in this case, you can copy and paste here the URL from the previous page. And then you just hit Execute. And it will auto-detect the file format. So it will recognize it as a FASTQ file and so forth. So on this right panel, you have the history. And so the first, when you first load a command, there are di different colors. So gray is basically it's waiting to, to get started. Then it switches to yellow, which means it's actually running. And then it goes to green, means it's done. And if it messed up for any reason, then it turns red instead of green. And so you know you have to go redo it again. And so you, either you gave it the wrong arguments or the command failed for whatever reason, so you have to go analyze. If you do this, this exercise, you'll have um, different numbers here. The number refers to the history. So this is the first command, second command, and I skipped one, and then fourth and seventh, and so forth. And so each item, once they're finished, uh, they have, um, uh, you can delete the command. So you, that we hit the X. You can edit the attributes, so you can actually edit you can edit the summary of that step if you want. You add more information uh, from from your analysis and why you did it this way and so forth. And then you have the what I call poke the eye. Poke the eye is to actually look at the file. And I always sort of call it poke the eye because it's a little eye to look at the file. But you poke the eye with your mouse, and then you can look at the data. So these are uploaded FASTQ files, and you can actually look at what the FASTQ files look like. Uh, edit the attributes. You can change the default name. So often it will be sample one of experiment one. It'll be very cryptic sort of uh, description of that file. And this edit the attributes allows you to, to actually put a much better descriptive and a better way, often shorter um, uh, way of, of naming the files. What I often do, this is all users uh, to, to each one's, uh, there'll be a default name that it generates, I will take that and I will copy and paste that into the notes as that that's the sort of a galaxy generated name and I will put in my own text in the uh, in the name of that file which makes it easier for example if you go to this one these brain one fast Q brain two fast Q, and so forth 
those are file names that I, I, I added to the, um, to the files. So for example, this is a FastQ uh, uh, trimmer. It's, uh, let's see, yeah. So you can sort of um, trim things up, uh, FastQ uh, groomer to sort of convert into different versions of FastQ. And so this example here, so we do a QC and manipulation on the, and so it's, it's fast QC is the program. You basically run every, all the fast Q files that we loaded, you run fast QC and these are the, the four um, types of uh, uh, brain and, and adrenal uh, RNA and fast Q format and the way they look, what they look like. So let's say we remove bad reads and, uh, and uh, that are, remove not bad reads, bad bases in the read. So it, we have, let's say, a, a cutoff um, a score, a score that uh, Michael mentioned. And uh, so we say if it's below 20, we remove them. And so uh, you can go do that for, for all of these reads. And again, the numbers here would vary. They do an RNA analysis, top hat tool. Step one uh, is to run top hat. Then you map the RNA seq and to it gets HG19, um, and because the reads are paired, you'll want these sets. Um, inner distance is known, so it'll be it's a default to, to 110 base pairs from this library. So you know this. Uh, there are two, as we was mentioned, you can um, know this by looking at histogram of your file size, but also in this case. It's in document on, on the library that was provided to us, so we know what that is. So these are parameters that you will put in onto this. Uh, uh, bye, Michael. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Safe travel. Um, yeah, so you run that, so you, you put in the... Uh, the, the name of the file, so you have multiple files, and so it knows all the files that you've uploaded. So you want to make sure you, you pick the right file. Uh, you built in uh, the the grooming. Uh, you make sure you have the right reference build. Uh, the uh, their paired end reads and uh, which uh, what you're gonna the fast file you're gonna read against and uh, the length 110 i told you and then you just execute initially all the files are yellow and then this takes about 30 minutes to do all the files so it takes a while and then you end up with um uh the, the, sorry the top hat was was uh about 30 minutes and then you end up with green files and you can look at them there's different ways of looking at them the galaxy has its own genome browser so you get another genome browser uh, this one's called Trackster, and uh, for um, which is actually quite nice, quite fast, uh, has advantages and disadvantages compared to the other ones that we've talked about. I'm glad to sort of uh, talk a little bit more about it later. But an important thing is that um, and now that you've done your experiment in Galaxy, it's a, it's easy to share with your colleagues. It's also uh, share the history with, uh, and you can also extract workflow from uh, the, the top right hand uh, option uh, widget. And uh, basically you can select which steps of your work. So it extracts all your work, the steps you've done, and you can select which ones you want to include or not include into a workflow. And then you can edit further, edit your workflow in a sort of a GUI interface where you can sort of connect things or delete things or steps and so forth. And um, I want to add that it's, uh, there's uh, lots of tutorials, videos, mailing lists, Twitters and so forth available for Galaxy. Um, there's, uh, there's a Vimeo channel for Galaxy project, uh, which has uh, very good high quality uh, videos. There's, for example, one on uh, ChIP-seq data analysis. Uh, there's other RNA-seq uh, with Trackster uh, pages that uh, Jeremy did, which are really good. And there are other ways uh, still to um, uh, use um, 
galaxy. Another way is a project called Genome Space. So Genome Space is another NIH funded project that actually still today, but it might not last forever, but you, I've told you about it, so you can go take advantage of it. Actually provides you not only Galax, but a number of tools, and it connects all these tools together. So for example, you can have um, an output of, um, of a Galaxy, which goes into a gene pattern. So it would be sort of a gene analysis, and then you can go into a, a sort of bigger statistical analysis project, or it could go into Cytoscape or it could go into um, IGV. And so what all these tools that are within, once you're registered in genome space do, is basically it provides the outputs of one tool and converts them into the input of the next tool. And so you're able to use within the genome space, you can use Galaxy and these other tools, and you, it, it ensures a connectivity between these tools. And there's all sorts of worked examples of how, why you would want to use this and so forth. The, the big secret right now is that, and it's not really advertised or described that well here, is that all the back end, the, store, the back end that holds all the pieces is actually AWS. So it's Amazon and it's free of charge. Okay, so it's free Amazon for now. It might not last forever, but right now it is. And so you can actually go do next gen analysis on Amazon compute infrastructure and storage on Amazon and it's paid for by genomespace.org. Sorry, there's no limitations on the site? I'm sure there is. And so I don't know what the numbers are exactly, but um, I'm sure if you reach those limits, they can, you can ask for more and so forth. So it's a, uh, it's a, it's a very well kept secret right now. No, 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 no. So, so there, I, I don't think uh, Amazon, actually, we have some expertise on that in the room, but I don't think Amazon owns any of the data that you upload to Amazon. Uh, the other companies may do that. Galaxy certainly doesn't do that. And uh, none of these genome space projects do that either. And most of them, are NIH funded sort of type initiatives so that they wouldn't have any rights to any of the data that you uh, generate or, or, or use on their platform. So from that point of view, I think it's, uh, it's quite uh, generous. So um, okay, so I'm almost done actually. Uh, a bit early again. So some useful resources. So Galaxy, uh, so usegalaxy.org, uh, use Galaxy, the cloud I mentioned, the Twitter account, the mailing list. Uh, there's a mailing list for developers, there's a mailing list for users, and there's actually a third mailing list for sysadmin people. Yes? Actually, it's going to be no mailing list anymore. They have That's correct. That's right. That's actually, I forgot that. I knew that and I forgot to mention that. So, um, so Michelle mentioned Biostar. So they actually, Biostar engine was developed at uh, Penn State and they've actually gonna have one for Galaxy as well. So they're gonna have all the Galaxy support is moving to away from the mailing list. I still subscribe to, I still get mail from the mailing list. That's why. <laughs> yeah. And, but, and then there's the developers mailing list and the sysadmin mailing list. So all of these things are going to be moving uh, to Biostar. So uh, there's also Open Helix, which is actually another interesting sort of uh, project. So Open Helix is a sort of commercial help desk, so to speak. And what they do is they make some of their, many of their things uh, openly available, like the UCSC Genome Browser materials, so they have lots of tutorials and things like that for UCSC Genome Browser that they make available, but they also make their packages available uh, commercially to institutions and so forth. So there's a lot of things which are not publicly available, but uh, some that are. So UCSC 
actually got a grant to pay for Open Helix to make their stuff publicly available, and that's one of the ways they make their stuff available. Seek Answer is actually a sort of another public repository of question and answer, much more directed towards next-gen sequencing analysis. Uh, like Biostar, but Biostar has is more, I would say, more general bioinformatics, uh, and more than next gen uh, analysis. Seek Answer has a, a definitely a lot more uh, of uh, next gen stuff available. Papers of interest that I've mentioned and so forth are available here. Um, so before we go on coffee break. What we're going to do now is I'm going to go back to sort of page 20 or so, and your which had this uh, instructions on how to log into the cloud, and with uh, Zeben's permission, he's not he's nodding if he's nodding positively, uh, and he's crossing his fingers. We're going to get started and uh, actually um, log in, and so after the lab, we're going to do. Uh, after the break, we're going to do the lab. So right now, we're going to log in and make sure that everybody's logged in before we go on break. I just want to acknowledge uh, Florence and Zeben for all the work and help they've done with me on, on making these lectures possible and making the, the labs work great. I'm really uh, thankful. They've done a really great job. And But if there are any errors or mistakes, those are all my fault, not theirs. And uh, so we're going to be on coffee. Oops.